Hello and welcome everyone to our GradFlix 2021 showcase. Uh, my name is Sarah Howard. I'm a graduate student experience specialist at graduate studies and postdoctoral affairs at the University of Waterloo. And I am thrilled to be your virtual host for our GradFlix showcase. Uh, this is our third annual GradFlix showcase, uh, but our first one that we are hosting virtually. Um, so even though we cannot be together in person today, uh, we are thrilled to have you all joining us remotely. I see we have lots of people tuning in live already. Um, so it's really exciting to see you all here uh, supporting our competitors who have made it this far in the competition. If you are someone who also wants to share your excitement on social media, I would encourage you to do that and to use the hashtag that we have for this event, uh, hashtag GradFlix, and also to uh, tag us on, if you're on Twitter, 
at our Twitter handle. Uh, you can see that at the bottom of the screen. So please use our hashtag, tag us if you're on Twitter. Uh, we'd love to see who is joining us and cheering on our competitors today. So before we get into uh, our showcase, I do have some housekeeping items to go over. Uh, so first, uh, if you are a finalist or maybe you're cheering on one of our finalists in particular, you are probably wondering when their video will be shown. Uh, in YouTube, if you expand the description for this live event, you will see a full detailed agenda for our showcase today, including the play order, uh, so that you can make sure you don't miss out on your video or maybe that video of the finalists that you're specifically here to cheer on. Uh, as you'll see in the description, we'll be starting out today with some introductory and welcoming remarks. Um, after that, we will move into our showcase where we will watch 25 finalist videos today. We'll be watching these in sets of five. Uh, this means we'll have time for a little bit of a break in between each of these sets of videos. So you have some time to digest and think about the amazing videos that you've seen. This also gives you a chance if you do need to get up, uh, maybe grab some more snacks or popcorn, some more drinks or just stretch. You'll have time to do that without missing any of our finalist videos. Once we've finished viewing all the videos, uh, you will have a chance to vote for the People's Choice Award winner. I'll explain a lot more about that later. Um, and uh, then we will do a live announcement of our winners, including the People's Choice, uh, before we close out our showcase today. So the second uh, item I want to bring up, because we are on YouTube today, you can uh, comment in our chat. I see we already have some chats coming in. We have uh, the Canadian Association for Grad Studies joining us today in C saying congratulations to all of our finalists. Uh, so please keep posting in the chat throughout the night. If you, oh, and another comment here from Graham Northcote, great job finalists, looking forward to seeing all these awesome videos. Graham uh, is someone from the Writing and Communication Center at the university, and I know he uh, supported us in our drop-in sessions, uh, so he might have had a sneak peek at some of these awesome videos as well. So please keep using that chat feature. If you're not um, able to chat, it may be because you're not logged into a Gmail account, you do need to be logged into a Gmail account to be able to comment. Uh, so if you're wanting to uh, write some note of support to some of our finalists or uh, comment on there about any of the videos, please just make sure that you're logging into your Gmail account first. All right, and I see many of you have already told us where you're tuning in from, but I think one thing that is really special about hosting our showcase virtually um, is that no matter where your friends or families or supporters are, uh, you're able to join us live, which has never happened before when we've been in person in Waterloo. So I'd love to see where we have people tuning in from. I saw at the beginning someone is uh, tuning in from Brazil. Uh, so whether you're across the country or somewhere across the world, we would love to see where you're joining us from and who you're cheering for. So keep sending that through the chat. All right, um, and while you're letting us know where you're from, I do wanna take some time to provide a territorial acknowledgement based on where uh, I am in the Kitchener-Waterloo area and where the University of Waterloo is situated. So the University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, land promised to the Six Nations, which includes six miles on either side of the Grand River. And this acknowledgement is part of our work towards reconciliation at the University of Waterloo. And if you'd like to learn more about the active work towards reconciliation happening across our campuses through research, teaching, learning, community building, I'd encourage you to check out our Indigenous Initiatives Office, where much of this is centralized. Okay, so while you're letting us know where you're from, um, I would like to invite our first special guest to join us live, our Associate Vice President of Graduate Studies and Postdoctoral Affairs, Jeff Casello, who will say some uh, words of introduction and welcome. Well, thanks so much, Sarah. This is just an incredibly exciting time and exciting, incredibly exciting day. I just couldn't be more excited to be here to see these videos, and I will admit that I did get a chance to have a sneak peek at some of the some of them, and they're just so incredibly amazing and exciting. 
Um, you know, we do GradFlix for a number of reasons. We do it because we want to help students learn to communicate their research. We can be the most talented researchers in the world, but if we're not able to share what we're doing and get people energized about the work we're doing, then we're missing an important element of the research endeavor. So this is first and foremost a communications exercise to bring together scholars and, and to support them in their work as they learn to communicate their research as effectively as they can. The other reason why we do GradFlix is because we want to create a graduate community. And you know, I was already inspired to see that we are reaching people globally today. That is just incredible. You know, the University of Waterloo prides itself on being a globally leading institution in so many ways. And now as we all come together virtually here to celebrate the fantastic work of our students, we really hope that this is creating a community amongst our graduate students. And you know, as we all do this virtually and we all continue to navigate this pandemic, it's incredibly important that we have opportunities to come together. So I'm thrilled in this time of COVID that we're able to connect in this way. We're gonna see 25 exceptional videos today. I want to make you aware that this has been the most competitive of all of our competitions for, uh, for GradFlix. There are many videos that, um, while superb in their own right, didn't make it here to the finalists today. So if you want to see those videos, you can do that on our YouTube channel. But really, I wanna congratulate those who made it to today's, final, to today's finals and today's showcase. It's an exceptional day with exceptional talented students. And again, I couldn't be more excited to see all of the quality work that's going to be displayed here today. And, and I wanna thank everybody particularly my team in, in graduate studies and postdoctoral affairs. These are a group of talented, talented colleagues who are so dedicated to our graduate students and to the graduate student community and all across the campus with our partners, um, the Writing and Communication Center, Center for Correction, all of those who are engaged in our, in our activities. Just wanna thank you so much for making today possible. So before I sit down with my bag of GradFlix popcorn, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce my friend, my colleague, and maybe most importantly, my boss, uh, the university's provost and vice president academic, Dr. James Rush. Jim, over to you. Well, thanks so much, Jeff, and uh, welcome to all of you, uh, wherever you are, and I hope you're all well. Uh, you know, to follow up on some of the themes that uh, Jeff introduced, uh, I'd like to just uh, emphasize that uh, in spite of a, a very disruptive and unusual year, it's so satisfying to see some important things continue uh, uh, in uh, familiar, even if they are different ways. And GradFlix is one of those very important, important things. And so I'm so glad that a new format um, been uh, adopted to allow that event to continue. You know, one of my biggest, uh, uh, um, viv most vivid memories of uh, last year was uh, participating in the GradFlix event. And at that time, I remember going into the Senate in the boardroom here at the University of Waterloo main campus. And it was just full, packed with, with uh, students with faculty members, with students, friends, and their supporters. And there was so much energy in that room that was such a physical and tangible display of what the graduate community of the University of Waterloo is. And you couldn't imagine a better way of showing it. Uh, we're not, we're not uh, allowed to show it in that way right now because of the, con the uh, constraints that exist. So I'm, I'm so glad uh, that uh, we can do it in, in, as I said, familiar but different ways. We have grad students, uh, competitors, uh, friends, family, supervisors, faculty, staff, and even uh, grad uh, studies officials from other universities uh, uh, in Ontario gathered with us today, not in our board and Senate room, but in their own rooms, wherever they are all over the uh, province, the country, uh, in the world, in many different areas. But they're there for this same familiar reason, and that's to celebrate the excellence of the graduate students here at the University of Waterloo, uh, their research, their ability to communicate their research and their ability to participate in this very unique way. You know, when I was in your shoes as a graduate student, which was some years ago, I'll admit, uh, uh, the ability to, to um, communicate about your whole thesis project in one minute would have been a completely foreign concept. We were still making physical slides that were being projected through a slide projector and the rule of thumb then was about a minute per slide in a 10 minute conference presentation. You'd be lucky to get a few experimental details out in a minute in that concept. Uh, so I am I am so impressed by both the evolution of technology that makes what's happening today possible, but more importantly, uh, the evolution of uh, graduate students 
the, their knowledge, their ability, their creativity, and their ability to bring to life in the way that you're going to see today, if, if this is anything like the grad flicks I've experienced before. Uh, I want to congratulate all the finalists. I want to congratulate all the participants in general, and especially the finalists, for making it this far. Uh, and I do look forward to watching uh, the videos. As Jeff said, this uh, was, I understand, the highest number of submissions uh, ever for a grad flicks event. And I'm imagining that means that the competition was uh, very tough. So congratulations to you all. Welcome once again. I'm going to grab uh, my popcorn. Jeff didn't send me a bag, so I have to make my own. I'm going to roll out the red carpet for all of you. And I'm going to switch over to YouTube to uh, watch the presentation. So thanks very much. Uh, and uh, uh, have a great event. Thank you so much to Jeff Casello and James Rush for joining us live and providing those welcoming remarks. Uh, we're really happy that uh, you could join us live today. So I see that uh, lots of people have been letting us know where they're from. Uh, one of our competitors, uh, Kayliana, says hello from Saskatchewan. I've seen posts from people all across um, the country pretty much as well as some international folks so welcome wherever you're tuning in from we're so excited to have you joining us live today so i know you are all so excited to get to watching the videos from our finalists but i do think that it's important to share a little bit about what gradflix is and how these videos are being judged before we get into watching them so first gradflix is a research communication competition so it's open to all of our masters and PhD students who are in research-based programs. And to participate in GradFlix, they have to create a video of no more than 60 seconds that describes their research to a non-specialist audience. No small feat if you have ever heard the large technical terms that most grad students use when they are talking about their research to their peers. These videos are then judged by our panel of judges based on three main criteria. The first being communication, uh, which is worth the most. It's worth 50% of uh, the judges score. Uh, so we really wanna make sure that uh, these students are presenting their research to us in a way that we can understand, even though we aren't specialists in their field. Secondly, 30% of the score is based on creativity and visual impact. We have other competitions at the University of Waterloo that uh, are based more on public speaking. Uh, but one thing that's really unique about Graphlix is that by creating a video, they have the opportunity to use um, images and videos to help present their research. So how creative are they being and how effective are those visual images? And then finally, the technical quality is worth the final 20% of the judges score. And having gotten a sneak peek of our sneak peek of our video submissions this year. I am not at all jealous of the job that the judges have in narrowing down 25 finalist videos down to just four winners. So this year that tough job falls to our panel of four judges. Uh, so our judges this year include Claire Birmingham. She is a returning Gradflix judge and the director of the Writing and Communication Center at the University of Waterloo. We have Ashari Wadira Jaya Bahu, who is an international relations manager at Waterloo International at the University of Waterloo. We then have John Dick, a business advisor for Velocity, also at the University of Waterloo. And finally, our final judge is Rob Hunsberger, who is director of design and construction services, plant operations at University of Waterloo. So as you can see, our judges are from a diverse a background and um, fields. And so if you can communicate your research to all of them, you are doing something definitely right. Um, so our judges will be selecting their top four videos whose creators will receive cash prizes of $750 for first place, $500 for second place, and $250 for third and fourth place. But that is not all. There is uh, still the People's Choice Award winner, so you as our audience will have a chance to vote for that once all of the videos have been played. We also do have a handy PDF uh, scoring sheet that you can use to track your comments, scores, and favorites as we move through the videos. Uh, so you can see the link on the screen there. You can use that to access that PDF score sheet. 
please keep in mind that that URL is case sensitive. So please make sure that you have grad in capital letters if you're having any issues accessing that link. So like I said, at the end of the showcase, we will open up voting before we announce the winner. So you will have a chance to vote for your favorite video of the night. Okay, so that should get you up to speed on what Gradflix is. And it is now time for us to start moving into the viewing of the finalist videos. So I have my popcorn here and some movie theater snacks. Um, so I hope you all have some snacks or treats with you as well. Let us know what you have with you in, this, in the chat or uh, let us know maybe what your favorite treat is when you go and watch the movies. No promises, but who knows if we're in person again some year, we may be able to use some of your favorites as recommendations. So let's get this showcase underway. Um, our first Gradflix video of the night is by Zhu Hyang Ryu. Zhu Hyang is a PhD candidate in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and his video is titled Advanced Training System. In the construction industry, 9.9 .9 million workers daily perform different physically demanding tasks. As a result, significant occupational injuries were reported in the United States and Canada. With more experience, workers obtain knowledge of safe and efficient work procedure. So, training expert work knowledge to the apprentices will potentially reduce workplace injuries. However, experts are often unable to articulate or convey their physical wisdom to apprentices. My research identifies opportunities for the advanced training system using working motion data. I firstly compared two experience groups' continuous motion data, then identified the most distinctive motion patterns of the expert using machine learning techniques. Now, I investigate efficient ways to deliver the findings as training system. My research will open the door for safer generation of construction workers. Thank you, Zhu Hyang, for starting us off. Uh, so our next Gradflix video is by Adam Rotoli. Adam is a Master of Science student studying in the Department of Biology. Here is Adam's Gradflix video titled Bats and Methyl Mercury. Bats really like to eat, with some insect-eating bats consuming as much as their own body weight in a single night. Although they need this food to survive, not everything in their food is healthy for them. The insects they eat can contain a toxic compound called methyl mercury, which has been made more available in the environment due to human activities. An insect can have high amounts of methyl mercury in its body if it developed in water where there's lots of it. When a bat gobbles up these insects, the methyl mercury gets transferred to the bat where it can cause problems such as neurological issues and reproductive effects. Since methyl mercury accumulates in living things, the amount of it in a bat might change over its lifetime. And although we know the levels rise after birth up until adulthood, what happens as a bat moves through adulthood is unknown. We can use the fur of bats to look at how much methyl mercury is inside their body. And if we take multiple fur samples over a bat's lifetime, we can infer the risk methyl mercury poses to bats as they age. In doing so, we can better understand and protect our flying furry friends. Thank you, Adam. All right, so our third video of the night is by Luke Hagar. Luke is a Master of Mathematics student in the Department of Statistics and Actuarial Science. Here is Luke's video titled Beyond P-Values, Sample Size Determination Using Bayesian Statistics. Imagine a charity that is testing if the average donation amount is the same when using their current and new websites. Testing such hypotheses is often done using p-values, but p-values are unintuitive. In this example, one may think that the p-value is the probability of the two websites having the same average donation amount. However, it's actually a probability that compares the data we observed to all possible data we could have observed if our hypothesis is true. So the American Statistical Association has urged statisticians to develop intuitive alternatives to p-values. Using the Bayesian interpretation of statistics, we can calculate the probability that a hypothesis is true, given the data we observed. Which poses the question, how much data do we need for our conclusions to be meaningful? 
In my research, I'm creating algorithms that recommend sample sizes to test if two groups have similar characteristics using Bayesian statistics and designing free software so those without coding experience can also test hypotheses more intuitively. Thank you, Luke. All right, our fourth video is by Ben Zoller. Ben is a PhD candidate in the Department of Religious Studies. His video is titled Catholic Social and Ecological Teaching in Canadian Farming Communities. Agriculture has a big impact on the health of the planet. Today in Canada, as in most places, the majority of farmers identify as religious, and many of those are Roman Catholic. Yet researchers are only beginning to examine how religious ecological teaching influences farming practices and agricultural policies. My project will look at this relationship using ethnographic methods. I'll visit three Catholic sites that combine spiritual and agricultural training. While I'm there, I'll hand out surveys, perform interviews, and make observations. Later, I'll go to participants' farms and homes to observe how they apply those teachings or include them in their day-to-day -day interactions. I'll also examine how Catholic documents, agencies, and leaders advocate for social and ecological justice. Together, this research will help us understand how religion informs Canadian society and responds to important environmental issues. Amazing. Thank you, Ben. This set, before we take a short break, is by Shoshana Spears. Shoshana is a Master of Science student studying in the School of Public Health and Health Systems. Here's her video titled Community Volunteers Addressing Food Insecurity During the COVID-19 Pandemic in the Philippines. When COVID-19 hit the Philippines, President Duterte implemented sweeping lockdowns across the country. This had devastating effects on those experiencing income poverty who, due to movement restrictions, were unable to earn an income, which exacerbated food insecurity. Concerned community members across the country saw the problem and were mobilized to action. Partnering with a Philippine-based NGO, they collaborated to pick up and distribute food packs to local families in need. Community volunteers worked collectively, reaching out to each other, the NGO, local governments, and other community members. Together, they were able to distribute 14 million meals. My research explores the experiences of these volunteers. What motivated them to mobilize? How did they take care of themselves while doing so? What factors influenced their ability to do the task? What are their perspectives of the program? Findings will inform the NGOs and other community mobilization efforts to ensure community volunteers be cared for as they willingly give their time and efforts in emergency response. Thank you, Shoshana. Amazing video so far. Those are just our first five. We still have 20 more to go. So as I said, the judges have a really tough job this year. So I hope that you've been enjoying this first set of videos as much as I have. I know we've seen some fantastic comments in the chat, people cheering on our competitors and their videos. Um, we have the math grad office has tuned in today, cheering on Luke, who is a student in their faculty. That's fantastic. Great to see staff showing up and supporting the students and their faculties and departments. Um, Barb Moffitt, who I know is a professor in the Department of Biology, says so she loved the animation, Adam, supporting one of her students there. I think we have a couple more. Yeah, and then, awesome. Someone else saying, this is so much fun. All of these videos are fantastic. So glad to see you're enjoying the videos so far. We have lots more. One thing that I think is fantastic is that in these first five videos, you have already seen uh, research from students in five of our six faculties. And um, by the end of our showcase tonight, you will have seen videos from students in all six of our faculties in many different departments and disciplines showcasing just a really great diversity of research. So thank you everyone. So one thing that I really miss about uh, being in person is seeing all of you, the audience, cheering our competitors. Um, last year, we even saw a group, all lab mates with posters. Uh, so while we're not able to see you in person, we do have your chats. 
but we would also like to see how you are actually celebrating grad flicks from home. So we have a selfie contest. We want to see how you're celebrating. So if you're a finalist, maybe this is more anxiously awaiting the results than celebrating at this point. But show us, take a selfie in front of your computer or your TV, wherever you're watching. Pull in those snacks that you have with you. If you have family members or friends or roommates in your house that are watching with you, pull them in um, and send us those selfies. There's a few ways to participate in this contest. If you are on Twitter, you can post your photo on Twitter using the hashtag Radflix. Um, and that way you'll be part of the competition. You can also get a bonus entry to the contest if you also tag us at UWaterlooGSPA in your Twitter post. If you aren't on Twitter though, no worries. You can still participate in our selfie contest. You'll just need to email your photo to gradventure at uwaterloo.ca to participate. Uh, and all that information is on the screen as well. As this is a contest, we will have one lucky prize winner uh, who will be picked at the end of the night. You have until the very end of the showcase to submit your selfies. So we'll contact the winner uh, after our event today. But if you submit your post, uh, your selfie earlier, uh, you may even have your selfie featured in our live stream tonight, just like some of our comments are being featured. So get those in sooner rather than later. Okay, so while you are planning out your selfies, let's get back to our videos. So we are starting off this second set of videos with a submission by Tatiana Bevlacqua. Tatiana is a PhD candidate in the School of Public Health and Health Systems. Here is her video, Design Principles for Health Informatics. As technology becomes more ubiquitous in healthcare, more data is collected, put information, and made available to expand our knowledge. Some people use information to decide which medication to prescribe, or if they're willing to take the medication to decide which one to order, or even to develop a new medication. Not only the purposes may vary, but our experiences and communities shape the way we make sense of information. Even though we are all using the same data, the way information is displayed may affect how we understand it. My research explores the role of technology in how we make information visible and for whom. I'm exploring how to empower design principles with artificial intelligence, using health informatics solutions to identify the different needs of the users through their natural use of information. All right, thank you, Tatiana. Our next Gradflix video is by Kaliana Giesinger. Kaliana is a Master of Environmental Studies student studying in the School of Environment, Enterprise, and Development. Here is Kaliana's video titled Economic Development Decision Support System for Sustainable Development. Since the establishment of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, economic development initiatives have become more commonly used to address poverty eradication. Economic development strategies emphasize job creation and increasing the tax base through the attraction of large businesses. Unfortunately, these approaches have typically been designed without considering systemic poverty or social ills and fail to holistically and objectively address community concerns. More recently, communities have emphasized that wealth creation and community expansion must also advance sustainability, quality of life, and social equity. Given that resources and expertise already constrain governments, there is a clear gap between importance and capacity to track and report these matters accurately. Multi-criteria decision-making has emerged as a viable tool for addressing the gap. Multi-criteria decision-making models are computerized tools that provide decision-makers access to objective evaluation and practical alternatives. Multi-criteria decision-making enables independent development techniques, advanced strategies, and improved stakeholder engagement. Thank you, Kaliana. Up next, we have a video submission by Joseph Varga. Joseph is a PhD candidate in the Department of Biology. Here's Joseph's video titled, From Farm to Fork, the potential role of antimicrobial peptides in modulating fish health and disease. Billions of people depend on fish as a food source. 
In 2019 alone, the average Canadian ate approximately 9 kilograms of fish or seafood. Due to increased global demand, more than half the fish we eat today is farmed. The aquaculture method is more environmentally friendly, however, it requires a lot of antibiotics to keep the fish free of disease. For my PhD research, I'm collaborating with a team of experts who have predicted pieces of natural proteins, also called peptides, that may have antimicrobial functions. I'm testing some of the peptides from fish on important bacterial and viral diseases with the hopes of using some of them as new antibiotics. I'm also investigating the effects of these peptides on the fish immune system using fish cells in the lab to see if they may be able to enhance the immune system because some of the pathogens are becoming resistant to current antibiotic therapies. Canada's aquaculture industry is a global leader in producing each product. Let's make it more sustainable for a better planet and healthier, tastier fish. Thank you, Joseph. All right, on to video number nine. Our next video is by Madhu Galapati. Madhu is a PhD candidate in the School of Environment, Resources, and Sustainability. Here's her video, Gender, Well-Being, and Dried Fish. Globally, about 12% of fish harvests are processed as dried fish, particularly in Asia and Africa. Dried fish support people's well-being in diverse ways. About half of the workforce in dried fish are women. Yet, women are rarely involved in decision-making. As a result, the challenges they face remain overlooked. My research asks the question, how women's participation in decision-making can be improved towards supporting well-being. I will develop case studies based on coastal communities in Sri Lanka. Findings of my research will help us better understand the challenges that undermine the well-being of women. Find out ways to include them in decision making and inform fisheries policies towards improving gender equity. Thank you, Madhu. All right, we're on to video number 10 now and the last video before we take another short break. This next video is by Mohammed S. Parsa. Mohammed is a Master of Applied Science student in the Management Sciences Department. Here is his video, Identifying Public Concerns About COVID-19 Using Social Media Mining. Health officials said it was inevitable that Canada would have a confirmed coronavirus case Huge, soon. The biggest quarantine in history. The number of affected countries has tripled. Now, a short time ago, the World Health Organization declared the outbreak an international public health emergency. The province of Ontario is heading into another lockdown. The American drug regulator, the FDA, has approved the BioNTech-Pfizer coronavirus vaccine. When a vaccine is ready, Canada will be too. Here to protest against a possible COVID-19 vaccine. I'm Mohamed Parsa, and at the University of Waterloo, I study social media to understand the public concerns about COVID vaccines. I begin with collecting millions of tweets about the pandemic and then use the AI and text mining techniques to extract fears, concerns, sentiment, and topics discussed about the vaccines. My work will assist health agencies and governments to address these concerns and thus make the vaccination easier. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you to all of those five competitors for those great videos. Uh, again, we have a short break here. If you do need to get up, stretch or grab anything, uh, do that now quickly so you don't miss any of the upcoming videos. Uh, so lots of great uh, chats coming in the comments again. I see one here. Uh, Heather is saying, great work, Tatiana. Um, see, we have a couple more here. Uh, Hannah says, love the circular graphics, Kayleana. Fantastic. And another here, one of our competitors, uh, Ben Zoller, saying really important topics in all of these projects. So, so great to see one of our finalists cheering on the rest too as well. Um, there really is so much important research happening across campus by our graduate students, and it's so great to see that showcased. So one of the reasons Gradflix is really such an amazing but also challenging competition is that our competitors really are taking these complex topics and trying to describe them to us as non-specialist audience members. 
Um, and our past competitors have said that these communication um, skills are really what they've taken away from the competition, whether it be you know, learning how to simplify comments or the, simplify their research for a public audience, using imagery to be able to communicate their research, or how to take their thesis research, which is hundreds of pages, um, and communicate it in an, an engaging way to a larger audience. Um, and I think that's what is really, really important here is that um, our grad students are doing really important research. And I know whenever I talk to them, they are so excited about the research that they are doing. And sometimes it's hard to communicate that importance and that excitement uh, when there are so many technical terms involved. Uh, so I hope that this is helping you to understand the research, the importance and excitement of it in a new way. Um, and I know we have lots of family members joining us in the audience today. I saw in the registration forms, we have family, um, grandmas, parents, um, someone coming, their supportive husband coming along to support their partner. Um, so for you family members, I hope that this is a new way to see the really exciting um, and engaging work that the grad student in your life is working on because I know that your support um, and your excitement along with them is really helpful to them as they go through their journey in graduate studies as well. Okay, so let's get uh, back to our videos now. Um, this is set three. Before we start this section, I do want to provide a quick heads up that the fourth video in this set, a video by Megan Dole, does contain a content warning at the beginning. Megan states her video contains a material related to suicide and it may be upsetting to some viewers. Um, so just keep this in mind as we go through. I will provide another quick reminder right before her video goes up as well. Um, so please uh, keep that in mind uh, as we watch this set of videos. Okay, so starting off our third set of videos now is Ryan Tennant. Ryan is a Master of Applied Science student in the Department of System Design Engineering. Here is his video, Improving In-Home Care with Voice Interfaces. Home care is rapidly changing our healthcare system, but unlike a regulated hospital, is provided outside a controlled environment. This increases patient safety risks such as medication or treatment errors that are most commonly related to communication breakdowns and poor coordination between caregivers. Designing digital tools for home care is challenging. Patient conditions vary, their home environments are unique, and their caregiving teams consist of both professionally trained and family caregivers. Current technologies don't consider the human factors of this complex system, failing to keep users engaged long enough to see improvement. Voice interaction technology like Siri, Alexa, or Google Assistants may provide a more intuitive way to interface with health information in the home. My research explores designing a voice interface through the perspectives of a diverse group of home care situations. Using interviews, surveys, and interacting with a low-level prototype, our caregiver-centered approach captures the considerations for conversational design and usability requirements to support patient safety in home care. Thank you, Ryan. Up next, we have a video submission by Anna Morinka. Anna is a Master of Arts student in the Department of Psychology, and here is her video titled Mediums for Self-Help. Life is full of problems, and our capacity to face them is intimately tied to our mental health. So how do we do that? When we solve a problem, we draw from our past experiences and think of how we've overcome such obstacles before. These memories form our mental models and we reference them to make predictions about the outcomes of our actions. Those predictions aren't always correct. When we experience errors, we update our mental models. Sometimes this process is hard, sometimes we get help, and other times we're on our own. My research compares how input from different mediums affects mental model updating, specifically for self-help purposes. My experiments compare mental imagery, visual imagery, and visual spatial imagery, determining which one leads to the greatest improvement in self-efficacy, our belief that we can get over the wall. My goal is to improve mental health resources for everyone. Thank you, Anna. So our next video submission is from Omar Sadab Chaudhry. Omar is a Master of Applied Science student in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering 
Here is Omar's video, Microplastics in Drinking Water. Over the last couple of decades, research has shown the widespread presence of microplastics in freshwater bodies. Pretty concerning, right? Microplastics are plastic particles that are smaller than 5 mm in size. They end up in the environment as a result of different activities which includes washing clothes, microbeads used in cosmetic products, and by fragmentation of larger plastic particles due to factors such as UV radiation, wind effect, and mechanical impacts of waves. During their residence in the water environment, different types of chemicals can be absorbed on their surface. These particles can then find their way to drinking water treatment plants, exposing communities to microplastics in their diet. Microplastics are found to be of different shapes, sizes, and types. There are important questions to be answered to allow safe water management, like how much are we consuming, which contaminant is the most concerning. This is where my research jumps in to answer some of these questions by creating a conceptual framework that synthesizes currently available data and then performing mathematical analysis to find answers. So hopefully, microplastics will be one less thing to worry about. Thank you, Omar. Okay, so we are now just over halfway through our finalist videos. Uh, and up next, we have a video by Megan Dole. Megan is a PhD student in the School of Public Health and Health Systems. As a reminder, her video does contain the content warning that it contains material related to suicide and may be upsetting to some viewers. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Here is her video, Multimorbidity and Suicidal Ideation. Suicidal ideation is defined as the thought or desire to end one's own life. The high prevalence of suicidal ideation among youth is a public health concern as it's one of the strongest risk factors for death by suicide. Suicidality presents a public health challenge as it leads to loss of productivity, premature death, morbidity, and healthcare costs. Youth with a physical illness are at increased risk for suicidal ideation, and this is exacerbated by experiencing a co-occurring mental disorder known as multimorbidity. I will investigate the association between multimorbidity and suicidal ideation among youth, explore individual factors that mediate or moderate this association, and identify trajectories of health service use over time and their influence on suicidal ideation. My research will generate knowledge for understanding suicidal ideation among youth with multimorbidity to inform prevention and allocation of resources. Since mental health and suicidality are often overshadowed during medical visits for physical illness, my research will inform the integration of physical and mental health care to respond early to suicidality. Thank you, Megan. Okay, our final video of this set before we go to another break is by Lillian Toma. Lillian is a Master of Science student studying at the School of Pharmacy. Here is Lillian's video, Novel Molecules to Treat COVID-19. COVID-19 is a respiratory illness caused by a virus called SARS-CoV-2. At the time of filming this video, there are 85 million cases and 1.8 million deaths caused by COVID-19, with these numbers continuing to rise every day. With such massive global spread, we need to expand COVID-19 treatment options available to patients all over the world. I will be developing small molecules that are potentially more economical, more stable, and show better patient compliance than currently available options. SARS-CoV-2 binds to our cells like a lock in a key. After this binding happens, the virus enters our cells and can spread. I will be designing small molecules that block the virus from binding to our cells. First, I will use a computer software that can predict if the molecules will prevent SARS-CoV-2 binding. Then I will create the small molecules and test their ability to block binding in the lab. This project aims to develop new small molecules to expand COVID-19 treatment options and help us become a healthier and happier world. Thank you, Lillian. Well, at this point, 15 videos in, my popcorn would definitely be empty if I did not have to keep talking uh, between every minute of video. Uh, so if you do need to refill your snacks or drink, this break will be slightly longer, but I would really encourage you to stick with us uh, if you do not need to go refill popcorn or drinks or take a stretch uh, because we have a special guest joining us live. I am really pleased uh, to introduce our special guest, Siavash Azadi. Siavash is a current PhD student in the Department of Kinesiology. When our first ever GradLix competition was launched for the 2018-2019 competition year, Siavash was an MSc student. He competed in that first year of GradLix and won both the third place prize and the People's Choice Award at that inaugural showcase event. So welcome, Siavash. Hi, everyone. Good, good to be here. 
Hi, Steve. Ash. So good to have you with us here live. Um, it's great to see you back at another showcase event. Always glad to be here. It's, it's very fun. Excellent. So I want to talk with you a little bit about the People's Choice Award. That was one of the prizes you won. And hopefully our audience members are thinking about who they're going to vote for as they uh, watch these videos. Uh, so one thing about the uh, People's Choice is we've traditionally seen that people that win People's Choice, like yourself, do well in the official judging. So you got third place. Um, but often People's Choice winner doesn't line up exactly with the judges. Um, so what do you think that our audience members are looking for or maybe placing more emphasis on than our judges when they're considering their vote? Um, I think uh, when it comes to um, audience, I think they really put emphasis on creativity and um, being able to connect with the material. Um, I think I found that uh, videos that tend to talk with the, the audience rather than um, talking at them seem to do better and helps make that connection between the audience and the content. Yeah, thank you, Sivash. So when you think about your mm -hmm. own GradLix video then, uh, why do you think that your submission stood out and won that People's Choice Award? Um, I think partly it was because it was a topic that everyone could relate to at the time. It was motion sickness. So um, unfortunately or fortunately, a lot of people can relate to that. Uh, so that seemed to stick with people. Uh, and I think it just, um, just the way the video was made, I think it just helped um, audience feel like they could, they were being talked to and uh, they were, uh, they were part of the conversation and felt like they could learn something from it rather than just a list of information being given to them. Uh, so I think that all kind of contributed. It was a, like the perfect storm, I would say, in that sense. That's great. Yeah, actually, I think the one thing that I specifically remember about your video is that one point the camera kind of shook and you talked to the audience saying, oh, are you OK? Um, and that connection point, I think, was really unique and because I still remember it and we're um, kind of two years later. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. So as I mentioned, you competed in our very first year of Gradflix. Uh, Gradflix was a brand new competition at that time. I mean, we've seen knowledge of it and interest in it grow every year. We keep getting more submissions. Um, so in that very first year, when you kind of just heard about Gradflix for the first time, what was it that attracted you to this competition and convinced you to actually put in the work of making a video and sending in your submission? Right, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think when it comes to research, there's at least at UW, there's so much cool research being done in every department as we've seen today. Um, I think there's always a disconnect between the research that's being done and the general public getting the information. Um, I think uh, what really wanted got me to do it was that I, I thought it was a great opportunity to get my research out to the general public. I think uh, any outreach um, possibilities or programs I think are excellent and uh, I'm sure other grad students can um, they can probably relate that uh, you go to a conference and you meet up with like-minded people but then the 90% of people that aren't part of that uh, part of the academia don't really get to hear about this stuff um, so I think that's what really got me attracted to it and wanted I that's what got me to make a video yeah, that's great. I think it's so helpful for the rest of us to hear what's happening. Like I said, all this research is very exciting and it's so important. And I think um, it's so great that you and the rest of our competitors take the time to share that research with us. Uh, so you mentioned that sharing that research is something you really, um, you know, think is important. Um, and we know that with COVID-19, you know, some of those traditional ways of sharing research uh, have been impacted and might be impractical, like going to a conference. Um, right. How are you and your colleagues sharing your research at this time when um, maybe a lot of those more traditional methods uh, aren't happening? Yeah, um, it's it's certainly been uh, a good time for creativity, that's for sure. Um, I, there have been uh, online conferences and been a lot of um, Kind of these like coffee talks where you just kind of log in and you have a chat with people. I know my department, at least where I do my research, um, CC Care, every month they put out a video which is very similar to Cloudflix, focusing on one researcher 
from that uh, lab. Um, I think it's just a good way to just get the word out, get people to still be invested in other people's research. Uh, even though we can't all together and talk about uh, our research and update each other, I think um, any way that we can get the word out and you know still collaborate is is great. That's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Siavash. Before we let us go, though, I might just put you on the spot for one last question. You are a PhD yeah. student now, so you have you know a few years left maybe before you're done. Any chance we might see another grad like submission from you in the future? <laughs> Possibly, maybe next year, maybe next year. Yeah, I would love to, it's great. Awesome, well, I will keep my eyes open for that. Um, and I wanna thank you so much again for joining us this evening, talking a bit about your experience. Um, and I hope that you have been enjoying all of our finalist videos so far and will continue to watch along. Always a pleasure, uh, I'm excited to see the rest. Awesome, thank you. Well, I hope those of you that did need to refill popcorn or drinks or take a stretch stretch break. I hope that you are back and ready to get into our uh, fourth set of videos. Uh, so we will get back into that. We have five more coming up. The first video in this set uh, is a submission by Annika Chang. Annika is a Master of Science student in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management. Here's her video titled Nutrient Leaching in Agriculture. Thank you, Annika. Our next video on the agenda is by Mia Stratton. Mia is a Master of Science student in the biology department. Here is her video, Paleolimnology and a Changing Delta. The Peace Athabasca Delta in Northern Canada is the world's largest freshwater boreal delta and is home to many species of wildlife. However, water levels in the delta have been declining. But why is this happening and when did it start? To answer these questions, we use paleolimnology. Paleolimnology is a science that uses the physical, chemical, and biological components of lake sediment to reconstruct past environmental conditions. This is done by extracting sediment cores from the bottom of lakes and studying the components within each layer. By dating the layers, we can identify what the environmental conditions were like during the time of sediment deposition. My research uses this technique to investigate how and why flood frequency in the delta has changed over time. Based on the timing of changes in the sediment, we can determine the relative influence of different stressors, such as river regulation and climate change. Identifying the cause is an important first step in protecting these ecosystems. Thank you, Mia. All right, up next, we have a submission by Claudia Sale. Claudia is a PhD student in the Department of Psychology. Here is her video, Preferences for Novelty Impacts Our Everyday Choices. Imagine you're at a furniture store and you see these chairs for sale. Which one would you want to buy? Which one would you want to learn about? My research explores why your answers to these questions differ. You might want to learn about this one because you can learn more new information from it than the one you're already familiar with. But this doesn't necessarily mean that you like or want the chair. It feels risky to have this one, as it might be uncomfortable, not work, or look out of place amongst your other furniture. So when choosing to have one of these chairs, you might prefer this one. 
This is a sophisticated strategy as it optimizes our learning and helps us acquire ideal resources. This emerges by age 5 and is used across many contexts, like in social scenarios. Children may prefer to befriend people who are similar to them, but are more willing to learn about people who have different customs or are from far away. So, discovering what motivates these preferences can help us understand how we make these everyday choices. Thank you, Claudia. Next up is a submission by Nicole Davey. Nicole is a Master of Environmental Studies student in the School of Environment, Resources, and Sustainability. Here's Nicole's video, Public Engagement Around Flood Mitigation in New Hamburg, Ontario. This is the small town of New Hamburg, Ontario. It is well known for its fall fair, historic downtown, and community spirit, but they have one problem. New Hamburg is located on a floodplain and frequently experiences severe flooding, which can cause negative impacts including health effects, displacement, and property damage. Yet people still choose to live in these high-risk areas. My research question is, why do people choose to live on the floodplain in New Hamburg despite the inherent risks? Focus groups were conducted with New Hamburg residents using photography as a method to gain understanding about perceptions of flood risk and why they choose to live on the floodplain. Participants captured photos which included many key themes such as affordable housing, family, access to natural areas, and much more. All participants expressed that the benefits of living in New Hamburg outweigh the risks associated with flooding. It is recommended that more education and engagement about flooding continues in the community to promote flood resilience. Thank you, Nicole. All right, so we are now on to the final video of this set with just five more videos to go after that. Uh, so this video is by Murdoch McKinnon. Murdoch is a Master of Science student in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management. Here is his video titled, Reclaiming Well Pads in our Boreal Peatlands. Peatlands are a type of wetland covering much of Canada's boreal forest. They're built up slowly over hundreds or even thousands of years as mosses die and become part of the organic rich soil. Because they contain so much organic material, peatlands hold a significant amount of carbon, which is important in the face of global climate change. They also provide a good quality home for all kinds of wildlife. The boreal forest is also where much of Canada's oil and gas is located, and to access the oil, thousands of well pads have been built, fragmenting our peatlands. Each well pad is constructed by removing all trees from the site, then layering clay or sand over top of the peat. This eliminates carbon sequestration and takes away valuable habitat. In theory, well pads should be reclaimed to the ecosystem that existed before the area was disturbed, but they're usually just planted with grass and forgotten about instead. My research looks at a new type of well pad reclamation where some of the pad is shaved back to create a wet sand surface. Mosses are spread over this surface, and I'll be monitoring whether they're getting the water and nutrients they need to start building up a new peatland over time. If it works, thousands of well pads may be able to be returned to carbon sequestering ecosystems and good wildlife habitat. Thank you, Murdoch. Okay, so only one more set of videos to go, but we are gonna take a short break again in case you need to get up, um, or just to give you time to digest those last five videos. So I had been told by my team that we have gotten in lots of great selfies on Twitter and to our email, uh, and we have some to share. So let's take a peek. This is great. So we have Elise Weiss. So she, Elise is uh, another person from the Writing and Communication Center uh, that helped us with our drop-in session. So again, she got some sneak peeks of these and that's great. Popcorn wasn't enough, so she brought her dinner. Awesome, the next uh, selfie here, we have people with both the poster and the popcorn. Awesome, so that must be one of our competitors. Uh, we sent them along a little swag box um, so that they could really set their scene and enjoy the showcase. And one more great, another person uh, watching along with us. So great to see your photos. Remember, you have until the very end of the showcase to submit your selfie for a chance to win a prize. Uh, you can share your photo on Twitter using our hashtag, hashtag Gradflix, and you get that bonus entry if you do tag us at UWaterlooGSPA. And again, if you're not on Twitter, you can always send a test by email. Uh, gradventure at uwaterloo.ca. Okay, so we are on to our very last set of videos. Um, so we are starting this final set off with a submission 
uh, here by Taylor Ludopia. Taylor is a Master of Science student studying in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management. Here is Taylor's video, Seismic Line Restoration in Peatlands. To map natural resources below ground, seismic lines are created. They are long, narrow corridors that cut through landscapes like peatlands. Peatlands are a type of wetland, and seismic lines negatively alter peatland functions to clean our air, filter our water, and provide shelter to many animals and plants. So it's important for trees to fill in these seismic lines. It was originally thought that they would naturally grow back, but more than 50 years later, still haven't. Many have attempted to restore them, and oftentimes that restoration fails. I'm trying to find the missing link to help make seismic line restoration successful. I believe seismic lines change the blend of nutrients and moisture, making it difficult for trees to grow. I will monitor new restoration techniques that address these much needed changes because we need our peatlands to keep our planet healthy. Thank you, Taylor. Up next is a video by Jillian Williams. Jillian is a PhD candidate in the School of Public Health and Health Systems. Here's her video, Substance Use and Mental Health Among Canadian High School Students. And many complex factors can contribute to this, including substance use. However, research isn't accurately measuring how students are using substances. Typically, researchers examine one substance at a time, but over 50% of substance-using youth use more than one. To solve this problem, I used data that tracks Canadian high school students over time and identified three substance use groups. Based on 2017 data, I found that groups using more substances had worse mental health. But with data from only one year, it is hard to tell if substance use leads to poor mental health or vice versa. Therefore, I will also look at data from 2018 and 2019 to confirm this finding. Ultimately, my work will help schools and policymakers better target substance use to improve students' mental health. Thank you, Jillian. Next, we have a submission by Sagar Patel. Sagar is a PhD candidate in the Department of Mechanical and Mechatronics Engineering. Here's his video titled, Temperatures in Metal 3D Printing. Powerful lasers are generally used to melt and join metal powder particles one layer at a time to obtain a 3D printed part. The physics of this process is somewhat similar to brewing coffee. To make good coffee, the two things that matter most are the type of beans and the temperature of the water. For example, for a light roast, we generally aim for a lower boiling temperature for water when compared to the dark roast beans to obtain a good cup of coffee. Through mathematical models and experiments, my research shows that metal 3D printing is quite similar. Automotive materials like aluminum alloys don't respond very well to excessive boiling, leading to numerous defects in the printed parts. Whereas titanium alloys used in bone or dental implants are much more resistant to boiling during printing. Using these learnings, we are able to print complex parts with higher performance for numerous industries. Thank you, Sagar. Okay, so we are down to our final two videos of the night. Uh, next up, we have a video by Ramesis Garav. Ramesis is a Master of Applied Science student studying in the Department of Systems Design Engineering. Here is his video titled, Towards Green and Energy Efficient Artificial Intelligence. Did you know that our brain consumes just 20 watts of power? It's a highly optimized system that the present-day artificial intelligence technology wishes to imitate. However, the current AI tech consumes too much energy when trained and deployed on the traditional hardware. Increased energy consumption leads to increased greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. The high energy consumption of AI models also poses significant challenges in their deployment in electric autonomous cars. Can we do something about it? Yes. Here comes the neuromorphic hardware, built on the computational principles of the human brain. They consume significantly less energy and run spiking neuron models. 
Therefore, I am building low power AI models that can be deployed on neuromorphic hardware, thus consuming less of the energy stored in batteries and subsequently leading to less greenhouse gas emissions while charging them. Thank you, Ramesses. And our final video of this showcase is a submission by Aaron Fortier. Aaron is a Master of Arts student studying in the Department of History. Here is Aaron's video, Urban Waste Management in Medieval England. How do you picture a medieval city? Dark? Noisome? All of that plague stuff going around? The population of London reached up to 100,000 people in the 14th century, and they all produced waste. How does a city of that size get rid of it without modern infrastructure like sewage? Unlike common perceptions, medieval people had a desire for cleanliness. They cared about what their communities looked and smelled like. We can prove this by looking at how cities regulated their urban environments. In London, professions like butchers, tanners, brewers, and fishmongers were highly regulated in terms of how their waste was disposed of, but very few historians have ever studied this. By looking at contemporary complaints and ordinances, we can determine how medieval peoples viewed, controlled, and created developing urban environments around them. Hey, thank you, Erin. Uh, and I do see in the comments on uh, YouTube uh, that there was a bit of a streaming glitch when we played Jillian's video. Uh, so we are going to be able to cue that up and play that again. Uh, so hopefully the beginning of her video will play this time. So once again, this is Jillian's video, Substance Use and Mental Health Among Canadian High School Students. Hi, I'm Jillian, and my research focuses on substance use and mental health among high school students. One in five Canadian youth experience mental illness, and many complex factors can contribute to this, including substance use. However, research isn't accurately measuring how students are using substances. Typically, researchers examine one substance at a time, but over 50% of substance-using youth use more than one. To solve this problem, I used data that tracks Canadian high school students over time and identified three substance use groups. Based on 2017 data, I found that groups using more substances had worse mental health. But with data from only one year, it is hard to tell if substance use leads to poor mental health or vice versa. Therefore, I will also look at data from 2018 and 2019 to confirm this finding. Ultimately, my work will help schools and policymakers better target substance use to improve students' mental health. Thank you, Jillian. So those are all of our 25 finalist videos for our showcase tonight. Huge congratulations to all of our finalists for making it to this point in the competition. And I must say, I am very glad again that I am not one of our judges having to decide who those top four will be. That will be an incredibly difficult decision. Uh, but you also, as an attendee, have a tough decision to make. Uh, you as the audience now get to select who you would like to win the People's Choice Award. So our People's Choice voting is now open. The link is on the screen and will stay up there for a while. As a reminder, this link is case sensitive, so please make sure uh, that you're typing it in correctly with the proper uh, case sensitivity, uh, otherwise it will not work for you. So a few notes about voting. Uh, you get one vote um, and the link will remain live for a few minutes. You will see a countdown on the screen letting you know uh, just before we're gonna close it. So make sure you get your vote in before it closes. So you may already know who you are voting for, um, but in case uh, you're still deciding, I am gonna quickly do a recap of our 25 finalist videos so you can remember what they were all about. Okay. So our first set of videos, uh, you first watched uh, Advanced Training System by Zhu Hyang Ryu. Then we played Bats and Methylmercury by Adam Grotely. After that was Beyond P-Values, Sample Size Determination Using Bayesian Statistics by Lou Kagar. Then uh, Catholic Social and Ecological Teaching in Canadian Farming Communities by Ben Zoller. And that first set of videos was finished off with the video Community Volunteers Addressing Food Insecurity During the COVID-19 Pandemic in the 
Teens by Shoshana Spears. In the second set of videos, you watched uh, Tatiana Belovacqua's video, Design Principles for Health Informatics, Kayliana Giesinger's video, Economic Development Decision Support System for Sustainable Development. Then you watched From Farm to Fork, The Potential Role of Antimicrobial Peptides in Modulating Fish Health and Disease by Joseph Varga. Uh, and then Madhu Gal Galapati's video, Gender, Wellbeing, and Dried Fish was played followed by identifying public concerns about COVID-19 using social media mining by Mohammed S. Parsa. In our third set of videos, uh, we started out with a video by Ryan Tennant, Improving In-Home Care with Voice Interfaces. Next up was Anna Marinka with Mediums for Self-Help, followed by Omar Sadab Chaudhry, Microplastics in Drinking Water, then it was Megan Dole's video, Multimorbidity and Suicidal Ideation. And finally, we watched Lillian Thomas' video, Novel Molecules to Treat COVID-19. That fourth set of videos then started off with Annika Chang's video, Nutrient Leaching in Agriculture, followed by Mia Stratton with Paleo Limnology and a Changing Delta. Claudia Sale then uh, her video is presented, which is titled Preferences for Novelty Impacts or Everyday Choices. Nicole Davies' video is next, Public Engagement Around Flood Mitigation in New Hamburg, Ontario. And finally, uh, finishing off that set was Murdoch McKinnon with his video, Reclaiming Well Pads in Arboreal Peatlands. Then that final set of videos you just watched started with Taylor Budopia, Seismic Line Restoration in Peatlands. Then we had Jillian Williams, Substance Use and Mental Health Among Canadian High School Students, followed by Cigar Patel, Temperatures and Metal 3D Printing. Ramesses Garav was next with Towards Green and Energy Efficient Artificial Intelligence. And finally, uh, Aaron Fortier's video, Urban Waste Management in Medieval England, uh, finished up that set. Okay, so you do still have a few minutes to vote if you have not been able to get that in there, so please do so. Um, well, votes are being cast and winners determined. I'm excited to welcome another special guest uh, to join us today, uh, Ryan Antua. Ryan is a social media specialist in marketing and strategic initiatives at the University of Waterloo, and he was also one of our 2020 GradFlix judges. Uh, so welcome, Ryan. Hello, hello. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good, good. Oh, I am all out of popcorn, but I'm going to get some as as things go on, you know. Good. I have not been able to eat mine yet because I have been busy hosting, so I'm looking forward uh, to when this wraps up and I can uh, munch on that popcorn. You deserve so, it. Absolutely. Happy to have you with us today. Really uh, glad that you're joining us at a second showcase in a row. Um, so first, as a social media specialist, I must say, I hope you've been using our hashtag and sharing your selfies on social media. Perfect. Um, but I do want to start off talking with you a little bit about your role as a judge in last year's competition. So I've already said, I don't envy that job. I do think they have the hardest job here tonight. Um, so with being a judge as hard as it looks, and how did you manage to narrow it down to a top four? See, it was difficult. Um, obviously things looked a lot different last year than they do this year, but the toughest thing is that the submissions are all amazing. You know, there's so many that stand out and watching, you know, different animations, different ways of presenting information. They're all so good that the biggest trouble that we had was narrowing down to the top four and then narrowing down the finalists, right? I mean, they're all just so good and so unique and so different that that's the toughest part for us. So I definitely don't envy the judges this time around, but, uh, You've got quite a task ahead of you, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, as tough of as a job as it is, it must be somewhat enjoyable because we do have a judge returning this year. Claire Birmingham uh, is doing that tough job again. Um, so when you think about those winning videos uh, from last year and also what you've seen tonight, you said they are so different. There's so much diversity in the types of videos as well as what they're sharing about. Um, so what makes those top videos stand out um, when you're deliberating? 
So there's a couple of different factors, right? I mean, obviously the way the information is presented, how it looks visually. One of the toughest things is communicating really intense research and results to everyday audiences too, through animations and through different text and visuals and things like that. So that perfect balance between great visuals and great animation is so well paired with you know tough research um, that that's usually the best mirrors that we've seen in terms of content and context. Um, I know last year there was a video by Marvin Pafla that included Marvin the cat and I love cats. So that was tugging at my heartstrings, right? So those little cues and little things like that definitely come into play when it comes to, uh, comes to videos. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's interesting. There, there are certain things that stand out to you. I do love cats as well. So that one, uh, definitely I was rooting for last year. I enjoyed the way that he <laughs> incorporated the cats into his video. Um, so I'll put you on the spot. Maybe I see a note that voting is closed now. So now that we can't kind of uh, influence anyone in their voting, do you have any top videos that you uh, just watched uh, that you think you might have voted for this time? Oh my goodness, there were so many, so many. I'd say, you know, Omar stood out, Jillian's. I was so impressed that Jillian had, you know, an avatar of herself animated speaking, which is incredible. And I mean, doing the research is one thing and, you know, presenting it is one thing, but then these animations and these, you know, visual cues that take a lot to do for even like a minute or two minute video. Yeah, I would say those definitely stood out for me. And as far as last year's too, uh, obviously Barb and the Cat, uh, Hayden Bulbrook as well, who did a deconstruction of, I believe, Munich um, back after World War II. So a lot of interesting submissions, that's for sure. Yeah, that's great. I know uh, another member of our team uh, works uh, or did her PhD in history. So Hayden's was definitely a standout for her. And I'm sure this year she really loved Aaron's. Anything that relates to, you know, what people, you know, have studied or what they're interested in definitely tends to stand out. That's for yeah. sure. For sure, for sure. So I want to kind of turn back to your expertise in social media and marketing. So one of the really big benefits about Graphlix is that all of our competitors, whether they became finalists or not, have finished off this competition with a really great 60 second, very short digital narrative that explains their research uh, to a non-specialist audience. So now that they have this great asset that they can use to share about their research, what do you think are some of the best ways to for them to actually share that research and promote it um, so that they can get more people to hear about what they're doing? That's a really good question. I mean, it of course depends on the social media platform, but the biggest thing that anybody could do right now is split up that content into bite-sized pieces for say Instagram, for Twitter, LinkedIn. I mean, if you really felt like it, you could even read the audio on Clubhouse, which is a new app, right? So having this beautiful piece of content means you can split it up for different audiences that understand it differently on different platforms. TikTok content is going to look a little bit different than LinkedIn content, or at least probably should. So you can split it up in different ways and have this beautiful portfolio piece that shows your skills, maybe an animation and visuals, shows your research thinking and how well you can explain things to different audiences, right? So I'd say definitely split it up into as many pieces as you can for different platforms. That's great. Thank you. I hope that our competitor and our finalists watching tonight will take some of that advice and really make use of the fact that they have these amazing videos and keep getting their research out there. I think uh, it's really important for more people to hear about what is being done by our grad students and the research that's happening. Absolutely. Um, so one last question. I kind of talked to Siavash a little bit about this earlier in the show. I'm not sure if you are in yet. Mm -hmm. um, but with COVID-19, we actually we saw a couple of people are doing research around that already. It's definitely a hot topic right now. Um, and it has changed the way that people communicate and share their research, especially because there was a lot of reliance on in-person conferences and lectures, which just aren't happening. Um, so based on your experience in social media and in marketing, how do you see there being changes in the way people communicate, especially around research communication? Oh my goodness. I mean, there's so many changes, right? I mean, not having the in-person aspect changes so many things, but it does mean that we adapt. So again, if you can chop up some of that content on social media and leverage it that way, that's a definite help. Essentially any way of getting things available through online platforms works out well. If we look at 
restaurants or even live music or things like that, those are so different too in terms of how they operate. But all you can really try and do is adapt your content to digital audiences, which judging from the content we've seen right now, it's going to be great. Yeah, for sure. The quality of the videos we get always astounds me. Most of these competitors have never made a video before and to come out with such creativity and such fantastic videos um, is just really remarkable. Absolutely. Yeah. So I do see a note now that our winners are all selected and queued up. So we are ready to move on to the announcement of our winners. So thank you so much, Ryan, for joining us. It's great to have you back. Um, and I hope that you stick around for our, the live announcement of the winners. Of course, can't wait. All right. So. Uh, to help with our live announcement of the winners, I will be inviting back Jeff Casello, our Associate Vice President of Graduate Studies and Postdoctoral Affairs. Hello, Sarah. Thanks for having me back. We are happy to have you back to help with that announcement of the winners. Um, I got a sneak peek of all the videos, but as someone who I think just watched them for the first time tonight, uh, do you have maybe any words you'd like to say before we move into the announcement of our winners? Well, you know, it's just inspirational. You know, as an administrator at the institution, from time to time, I feel like I get removed from really the, the brilliance of the academic work that's going on at, at Waterloo. And people will have heard me say this before, but as a professor, our job is to get up in the morning and go to work and spend time with really the brightest and, and best minds in Canada and the world. And when I get a chance to watch these videos, these 25, and I know that there were more, I mean, I, I'm just, reinvigorated and re-inspired to, to get back at what we do because graduate studies is so impactful and so transformative. It's just been an absolute honor and a privilege to be part of today and to get to experience the videos. Just, just fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jeff. Um, so now it is the time that I'm sure all of our finalists have been anxiously waiting for since they heard that they were finalists last week. Um, so uh, we, Jeff will start by announcing a fourth place prize up to first place, um, and then we will announce the People's Choice winner as voted by you after all of those judges' prizes and winners have been announced. Um, so I will ask if we can have a drum roll, please, as we get into these announcements. Okay, so first up, Jeff, please announce our fourth place winner who will receive a prize of $250. Our fourth place winner today is Madhu Galapati on gender well-being and dried fish. Congratulations, Madhu. Yes, congratulations, Madhu, on that fourth place win. Okay, so next up, Jeff, is our third place winner who will also be receiving a $250 prize. Can you do the honors? Alrighty. Okay, I didn't know if we were getting another drum roll. You know, I like those. So our third place winner today is Ben Zoller. Ben on Catholic social and ecological teaching in Canadian farming communities. Congratulations, Ben. Yes, congratulations, Ben. Okay, so next up, Jeff, for you to announce is the second place winner who will receive a prize of $500. Please do okay. the honors. I'm ready. Our second place winner today is Murdoch McKinnon, who talked to us about reclaiming well pads in our boreal peatlands. Wonderful. Congratulations, Murdoch. Okay. And finally, Jeff, will you please let us know our judges' top pick, our first place winner who will receive $750? Oh, can't we just say they're all winners, Sarah? No, I, I guess I should read the, the the winner. Our judges deliberated long, they deliberated hard, but they have chosen Anna Morinka for Mediums for Self-Help as our first prize winner today. Congratulations, Anna. Congratulations, Anna. Congratulations to all of our winners. Uh, I see also there are lots of congratulations comments pouring in from the chat. Um, well deserved. And um, thank you to our judges, Claire, Rob, Ishari, and John uh, for their hard work and time reviewing all of those videos um, and doing that hard decision of selecting our winners. As Jeff said, all, all of our 
all of the videos we received were fantastic. Um, we do think that all of them are, are winning videos in our minds. Okay, but now it is time to transition into our People's Choice Award winner. Uh, it's time to find out who you, as the audience, selected for that People's Choice Award. Your favorite will receive a prize of $250. Uh, Jeff, will you please reveal our People's Choice Award winner? I am honored to do so, Sarah. Our People's Choice Award winner is Annika Chang. Congratulations, Annika, on nutrient leaching in agriculture. So congratulations, Annika. Congratulations, Annika. Um, what a great showcase. Again, all of the videos were really fantastic. I know it was already a tough decision to even choose who could be uh, the finalist this year. So, so those winners were such a tough choice. Okay, so before we uh, let you go, Jeff, um, I just wonder if you have any final comments uh, before I move to wrap up our showcase today. Well, you know, it's customary here to, to, to say thank you to all the people who made this possible, but I really want to do that and be very sincere in, in that. Um, Sarah, you've been just fantastic as our moderator, and I know that you did so much work leading up to this and behind the scenes, Angela and Tasha and Rachel and the whole team, Marta uh, and our colleagues from outside of GSPA, a sincere word of thanks. And I know that our students value all the efforts that you put into an event like this. But the real winners today are our students. And for sure, the community sees the, the caliber of the work that we do, how spectacular our student body is and how talented it is. You know, sometimes we, as again, as administrators, we struggle to convey the importance of graduate studies to the broader community and to be honest to government. But today's like the days like today restore my faith and restores my commitment to making sure that the word gets spread because there's so much phenomenal work going on at Waterloo and around this country and around the globe by our graduate students that we need to continue to support that in every way possible. I want to encourage our graduate students to keep in touch with us at GSPA, monitor your e-news, stay in touch in any way you see fit. If there's anything that GSPA can do to help support you as you continue down this journey, we're pleased to do so. So please keep in touch. Thanks again for participating and congratulations to all of our winners. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you again for joining us and for doing that announcement of the winners. Uh, we will let you go now um, and I will just take care of a few uh, final housekeeping items. Um, so first of all, I do hope you all enjoyed the videos as much as I am. I know we've been seeing lots of great comments coming in the chat and I think we have a couple more to profile. Awesome, we have someone saying you are all winners in my books. I totally agree, a fantastic set of videos. I think we have a few more here uh, from Medu, one of our competitors in the fourth place winner. Congratulations and best wishes to everyone uh, who participated this year, such impactful work that we all do. I totally agree with that. Um, I think all of the research that was shown today was very important and very impactful, so great to hear about it. Uh, another comment was a wonderful opportunity to see some exciting research on this innovative campus. Uh, so thank you and congratulations to all the competitors. A job well done. I completely agree with that. Everyone really did a fantastic job, especially when you think about the fact that really most of our competitors have never created a video before. Um, that just really astounds me and is so impressive. All right, and finally, great event. Thank you to all the participants. Um, and of course, the uh, presenters. Yeah, so thank you everyone um, who participated and made this happen. We specifically want to thank all the attendees for joining us live. Um, it was a hard, it was really a challenge to think about how we would do this event in a virtual environment. We love having everyone on campus cheering on our competitors and the amount of comments that came through the chat. I think really just brought that energy and hopefully showed our competitors um, that they are so supported um, and that there are people out there who are really enjoying hearing about their research. So thank you for engaging with us today and for joining us live. Thank you to our judges again for that tough decision that they had to make. I know they really do spend a lot of time between watching the videos, uh, doing their scoring and the deliberations. So thank you um, for all of those. Um, and most of all, thank you to our competitors. You really are the reason that our showcase uh, is a success. So thank you. Finally, if we were in person, I would be inviting you all to stick around, to mingle, uh, to chat with our finalists, offer your congratulations, and ask maybe any questions that you have about their research now that you've seen just a tiny snippet of what they're doing. Um, 
Since we can't mingle in person, I would encourage you to instead offer your congratulations, your comments, or your questions to our competitors directly. On our YouTube channel, a GradClix playlist should now be visible where you can see all of our uh, GradFlix videos. In the description for each video, you will find contact information for the graduate student who made that video, so you can reach out to them. Like I said, offer your congratulations, follow up, maybe you see some opportunity for some research collaboration with them. So please do reach out to our competitors if you have questions, comments, or congratulations for them. So you will find all 25 finalist videos from the showcase in that playlist. Additionally, we had such high quality submissions this year that we wanted to be able to feature as many of the excellent submissions as we could. Uh, obviously, 25 is already a lot to host in, um, in a showcase, so we had to limit that. But we have put an extra 26 videos on that YouTube playlist. So there are 26 more amazing Gradflix videos that you have not yet seen um, on that playlist. I'd encourage you to watch um, all of the videos, comment on social media using our hashtag, um, share which ones are your favorite, and connect with our competitors. So congratulations one last time to all of our competitors, finalists, and winners. Um, it's very well deserved. Um, and it's, to you attendees, thank you so much for tuning in live. I hope that everyone enjoys their evening and their weekend.